the first question that pops up, obviously, is what is an analytical essay? It's a fair question. When I was a college freshman, I freaked out when somebody told me I had to write a paper. and I didn't know what that meant. In this case, an analytical essay means the presentation of some type of argument or claim about an object that you are analyzing. That's it. Anything. It is not a summary of that. If you're going to analyze a short story or a movie or something like that, and you give me plot description, I will throw it out. It's garbage. Because I'm guessing whoever wrote the original book, story, movie, what have you, is probably a better writer than you in terms of that story. So just reading a summary of it, this is what happened. Jack and Jill went up a hill and uh, we're looking for something to drink. You know, not the same. The value added comes from you providing an interpretation, an analysis of that. The reader wants more than just a repetition of the original text. So you focus on not the what of the text or the object to be analyzed, but the how. Analysis, or an analytical essay for our purposes, means looking at something and figuring it out. How does it work? What does it do? Why does it do that? It is a journalistic enterprise, and so you adopt semi-journalistic methods. You ask the standard conventional journalism questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. This is reductive, but it's a start. You boil something down, wrestle it into some kind of objective position, and you start. And you say, this is what I can make out of it right now. Other people might make other things out of it. You might change your mind two minutes after you step away from the keyboard and suddenly say, but you know, everything I just said was garbage because now I see that it's really about this and this is how it works. <clears throat> That's all fair. But for the purposes of hammering out an analytical essay assignment as college generally expects you to do with great frequency, it helps to just go about a few simple steps. You craft your essay as a demonstration of the answers you've discovered investigating that object. Sometimes the essays can be more about uh, the exploration itself rather than the discoveries. A French writer named Montaigne in the 17th or 16th century uh, pioneered this form where he wrote some very long essays, some very short one, but some very long essays, which were often more about the process of his thought, where he would just take up a subject and start following his own whims. <clears throat> noodling around with something. And he would basically just write a stream of consciousness. That is very difficult to pull off well. Montaigne was, spoiler alert, a better writer than you guys. Please don't take that the wrong way. Try to avoid doing that. Don't just launch off on your own loosey-goosey stream of consciousness exploration and take notes as you go. Think about what you have to say. Think about the object. Develop your understanding, your analysis of it. And then write the essay as if you are introducing your reader to your conclusion. We spoke about this last time. Your conclusion is 
the interpretation you have reached at the end of a process of thought. And so your conclusion is, paradoxically, the introduction to your essay, where you tell your reader, I have thought about this, I have researched it, I have spent some time with it, I've dug into the details, and this is what I think. That's a conclusion. And so for a paper, for your purposes, it's your introduction. And then everything that follows is you explaining that conclusion to your readers. Remember always statement, evidence, explanation. This is what I will be grading on if I don't see these steps in your paper. Now, for our purposes, I want to consider one of the readings for this week, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Uh, I will presume that you have all read it, and I will presume that it confused you a little, perhaps bored you a little, uh, perhaps you didn't know what to make of it. Maybe you didn't even reach or notice the little atom bomb in the middle of that essay. If you read attentively, if you read skeptically, it reveals itself at that moment, very dramatically. But it lays the groundwork for that all throughout. To remind everybody and refresh your impressions, your understandings, uh, a modest proposal is what? What is Jonathan Swift proposing in this essay? What is the essay about? Okay. Shy, I get it. Jonathan Swift writes an essay about poverty in Ireland. For context, Jonathan Swift is writing in the early 1700s. He is a uh, aristocrat of sorts. He is living complicated life on the relative upper crust of society in a country that is overwhelmingly poor and is also subject to rule by the British government for whom or for which Swift is basically a representative of. He is also writing about, he is also writing in a time known as the European Enlightenment, which was where everybody ran around really impressed with how smart they were. It's like Silicon Valley. They think they're geniuses and that what they're doing will make life perfect on Earth because they're doing it so intelligently. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through the great town or travel in the country when they see the streets, the roads, and cabin doors crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags, importuning every passenger for an alms. These mothers, instead of being able to work for their, lo for their honest livelihood, are forced to employ all their time in strolling to beg sustenance for their helpless infants, who, as they grow up, either turn thieves for want of work or leave their dear native country to fight for the pretender in Spain, or sell themselves to the Barbados. You read the footnotes and you can see what they mean by the pretender in Spain. The uh, bit of selling yourself to the Barbados is a allusion to slavery. Uh, but clearly he is writing about the problem of beggars in the streets. And he is offended by this, the sight of them. What is his solution for this that shows up several paragraphs in? Cannibalism. 
There are too many children in society who have nothing to eat. So why don't we eat them? Eat the children. That way there aren't so many children around to be hungry and the parents get a nice meal out of it too. Prudent. Yes. He lays this out with a very scientific air. He lays this out with a kind of dignified, rationalist, intellectual air. Much like a lot of the writers of the day who were proposing sweeping changes without really thinking them through in a moral way. And he does this Swift does this with humor. It is funny. He's not really, spoiler alert, he's not really advocating eating children. I think we can all agree that that is a little outlandish. I would hope. But it is part of the mockery that he is employing. Because if you can't make a point by uh, honest and earnest intellectual debate, humor cuts through everything. Deadpan humor can be used as a savage social critique. We can see this in Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. This text uses a very professional and even scientific writing style to satire the inherent cruelty of contemporary social policy and the intellectuals who support it. That is my interpretation. That is my claim, my argument. That is my analysis. Swift never comes right out and says, I was just joking. He does not end this essay with a LOL. He never tips his hand like that. But he trusts that you, as thinking readers, will be able to judge when he's being serious and not. He's using humor. That is a bold thing to say to make an assumption about what a writer really means when it's never actually said in those specific words on the page. But this is what analysis is all about, getting at it and seeing how does this actually work? What is this really trying to say? Much of the effect of this essay comes from vocabulary. Swift builds the essay slowly, dropping a word like computation in the fourth paragraph, letting slip these off-key notes that steadily accrue. He uses a very scientific and mathematical vocabulary, making it seem like it's a serious, scientific, policy-driven paper. He also makes use of numbers. The conspicuous use of numbers and mathematical precision adds to this illusion of objectivity. Just a couple of paragraphs in. The number of souls in this kingdom being usually reckoned one million and a half, of these I calculate that there may be about 200,000 couples whose wives are breeders. Curiously loaded word there. Breeders, makes them sound like animals, from which number I subtract 30,000 couples who were able to maintain their own children, although I apprehend there cannot be so many under the present distress of this kingdom. But this being granted, there will remain a 170,000 breeders. I again subtract 50,000 for those women who miscarry or those children die by accident or disease within the year. There only remain 120,000 children of poor pet parents annually born. He's doing math. And what have I said in the past about numbers? They impress me. 
if you know numbers, I respect you because I don't. So if somebody starts throwing math around at me, I'm just going to say, okay, they don't they know what they're talking about. You can't lie about numbers. They're right there. Numbers. It's solid. It's rock hard. But he's throwing these numbers around to impress you, to build up his own credibility. He must know what he's talking about. He's got data. So between that and the vocabulary, it sounds an awful lot like an official government report. After dancing around his theme, playing it with it lightly, Smith Swift hammers his scorn into his readers at the end with first, secondly, thirdly, fourthly, fifthly, sixthly, which is kind of silly, even for English of the early 1700s. Sixthly, is that even a word? Tipping lightheartedness into contempt. He is taking huge bites out of his readers' hides with this. Not necessarily his readers, but the intellectuals who write like this, with this kind of amoral, immoral, dispassionate cruelty. Reducing human beings and their suffering to simple data points on a spreadsheet. And throughout He's still maintaining, he is still maintaining the organized rhetorical strategy that is so familiar to the intellectuals and policy makers he was lampooning. Now, I want to point out that this little chunk is about vocabulary, words. This line with a citation here where I can go and quote everything that I just read to you uh, is about numbers. So that's a second paragraph. And then this line is about another example of how this style manifests itself as a rhetorical strategy. Three separate paragraphs with three separate examples of, an, of analysis of the text. So if you were writing Again, I'm bad with numbers. If you are writing a five paragraph essay and you have three paragraphs of analysis that you need to get through, what's left? Two. Introduction and conclusion, which I've already said is kind of the same thing. So you can just refresh in a conclusion. I already sketched out an introduction, a simple three sentence orientation of the reader towards my argument. And then I can just come down and write up a little something else. The Enlightenment mind can get carried away with its own capacity for thought by prizing intellectualism all over all else. Blind spots inevi inevitably appear. John, uh, Jonathan Swift. Oops. Swift. With mastery of the form and shows his society and ours what humor can do when logic falls short. That's a conclusion. That is an, an analytical essay that just needs a little bit more dressing throughout, a little bit more fleshing out. 
That did not take me that long. Granted, I'm starting from notes and I had all those pasted in there, but I, honestly, I did not spend a lot of time looking at that. An analytical essay takes a step back from the text and explains how it works. Throws open the hood, let's say, and tinkers with the engine. Let's go exploring. Let's see how it works. And by understanding that, by understanding how that works, you can maybe use the same techniques. I don't know. Maybe someday, somehow, some way, you will want to one day uh, tell a joke. Be a little sarcastic. You know? Or maybe if you don't want to get that creative of actually telling a joke, being a little sarcastic, offering a little snide comment here or there, maybe it'll just be a case of you'll finally be able to get when other people tell jokes like that. There's that miraculous moment where you realize, you mean Stephen Colbert was kidding? Jokes are a lot better if you can see how they work as they're working. When a comic or a writer can say something with deadpan seriousness and you know the whole time that he is cracking up on the inside. That's all you have to do here. Review objectively what a text might be. Develop an interpretation. And then put forth that argument. Put forth that interpretation. Don't summarize. Assume that your readers have done all the reading. And that repeating the details of that reading will be a waste of time. But what your readers don't have, if they have read Jonathan Swift's article, what they don't have, what is new, what is alluring, what could be a benefit to them, is your perspective. That's the value added. It's much more entertaining to reread Jonathan Swift than you retelling what his essay is. But if you can give them an idea of how it works or your perspective on how it works, that's new, that's fresh, that's enticing. And everybody wants what is new, fresh, and enticing. So, that's all you have to do for this assignment. Again, I don't remember exactly what the point value is. It's like five points or 10 points or something like that. It's not a lot. But like everything else that I have been trying to do for the last couple of weeks, it's building towards the paper. If you can do this, where it's just about you read Jonathan Swift's essay that is a couple hundred words uh, or something else, roughly the same length or so even. Uh, develop a idea about it. That will be much easier than a research project where you have to go out and find multiple sources and start pulling all of those texts together into an argument against one another where you're just kind of moderating the fight. But this step has to happen first. Master this form first and that next one becomes much easier. We are building very strategically towards that goal of you being able to sit down in another month, let's say, 
I forget when the rough draft deadline is. It's around that. When you can just sit down and grind out a rough draft and have it be plausible. And you don't have to sit there spinning your wheels forever about, well, okay, how do I say this? What do I do this? I, 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 I have a lot of articles and, and, and research done in all of these charts and numbers. And maybe I can just push them at the reader and say, yeah, you look at it. You sift through all of that, and then you tell me what you think about it. No. Your job is to do the research yourself. Your job is to do the analysis of that research yourself. And then your job is to communicate that analysis of that research to that reader. 